Hi Rocketeers, I'm Charlie Garcia and this is episode 2 of Solid Rocket Motors. The case is the structure of our rocket motor. It holds together all the other parts and transmits thrust to the airframe of the rocket. The case is also the last line of defense protecting the other hardware and your person from rapid unscheduled disassemblies that may occur during testing. A good case design needs to be mechanically sufficient, lightweight, cheap to make, and ideally easy to use. This feels like as good a place as any to insert a warning. A poorly designed case can overpressurize, explode, and fail catastrophically, throwing tiny shards of metal your way and giving you very painful if not life-threatening injuries. Alright, let's work down the list of requirements we put together for our case. The first thing to consider, obviously, as with any good rocket project, is safety. Alright, the obvious way to make a case safe to use is to design it so that it never explodes. This is straightforward for a rocket motor that is functioning normally, but unfortunately, rocket motors don't explode when they're working as they're supposed to. Most rocket motors explode when their pressure rapidly increases as a result of a defect in the propellant that was cast into them. As we learned last episode of Solid Rocket Motors, uh, pressure is a function of the surface area of the propellant. So if there's a void or a crack or other mechanical defect in the propellant, this will cause a rapid increase in burning surface area, which will cause a rapid increase in pressure, leading to a rapid decrease in the amount of cases you own. Designing a case that's strong enough to handle this scenario is impractical, so we're left to find other methods of making the case safe, knowing that it's a possibility that it could explode. There are two ways to design a case to fail gracefully, and we're going to do both of them. The first is what's called a structural fuse. A structural fuse is a component that's designed to fail at a known pressure in a known fashion. And this known pressure is above the working pressure of the motor case. So the idea is, is that if something bad happens before the case goes all the way to a super high pressure that destroys the entire case, uh, this structural fuse uh, fails and releases the pressure inside of the motor case. We'll be working on the structural fuse in a future video because we're going to build that into another component we're going to make. And in this case, we're just talking about the case. The second way we can make the case safe to use is by using a ductile material. Ductile cases will banana peel when they fail. That is, they'll tear down the middle and they'll release the pressure. And this is distinct from, say, a frangible material case, which would shatter into a bunch of tiny pieces uh, like an eggshell uh, dropped from a height. This is the point in the video where I have to acknowledge that there are other solid rocket motor tutorials on the internet. One of the most popular ways I've seen to make solid rocket motors is to mix together potassium nitrate and sugar and cast it into a length of PVC pipe. There's a myriad of reasons why this is bad. For example, the... But the real reason why you shouldn't ever make one of those motors following one of those tutorials is that PVC pipe cases are the absolute worst. PVC is an incredibly brittle material with a nasty secret. Its chemical composition is so similar to the chemical composition of your flesh that if you get pieces of PVC pipe in your body, uh, some low-end x-ray and CT machines can't actually see them inside of you. This will mean that the doctor has to do exploratory surgery in order to find the pieces of shrapnel and remove them before they cause additional damage. To make a very, very long story short, to limit the entire world of possible materials we could choose, aluminum, stainless steel, good ductile materials. PVC pipe, carbon steels, these are fragile materials, we want to steer clear of them. We'll be using aluminum for this case. It's cheap, lightweight, easy to get our hands on, and even easier to machine. It's a great material for almost any solid rocket motor case. It's been used in a lot of similar applications, and it's used extensively in the hobby. So we really have a good idea of what we're working with here. However, there's some minutia to worry about. The exact composition of the material we're using is important. Uh, for example, 7,000 series aluminums can be over 30% stronger than 6,000 series aluminums, uh, but that's only at room temperatures. At elevated temperatures, sometimes the reverse is true. Uh, so you really need to think about what it is you're doing and uh, dig into the specifics of your application. Uh, for our case, though, since the 6,000 series is sufficiently strong for our needs and also cheap and readily available, we'll be going with aluminum 6061T6. This is the most widely, avail uh, widely available alloy of aluminum tube, uh, so easy to get our hands on. From our last video, we actually know the dimensions of the case. We input these as the inner diameter or the, of the case or the outer diameter of the grain geometry we were using uh, when we designed our uh, rocket and open motor. From the last video, we actually already know the dimensions of the case because we know the dimensions of the propellant that we're going to be putting into the case. 
But we need to make sure that our case will be strong enough to withstand the pressure we've designed our rocket motor to operate at. In this day and age of computers, everyone is always tempted to run off and ask a CAD program to do finite element analysis and solve for the structural properties of a case, but we really don't need to do this. It's super simple just to do a hand calculation and decide if your case is going to be strong enough. In fact, in industry, uh, most aerospace companies won't even trust the output of a computer unless you can do a hand calc and get a close to similar result. It's too easy for the computer to follow the garbage in, garbage out principle, and you really have to be able to ground your analysis. So we'll do that here. We only need to consider two stresses on the case. The first is going to be the hoop stress from the pressure inside the case, and the second is going to be the axial stress from the stress on the end caps of the case. First, we're going to calculate the load on the ends of the case. We'll do this by calculating the area of one of the caps and then multiplying that by the pressure inside the case. While theoretically, the case only needs to survive the maximum pressure of the motor, to make it more useful, I'm going to design this case to work all the way up to 1500 PSI so that I can put possible future motor designs in it as well. The case has an inner diameter of 2.0 inches, giving us an area of 3.14 inches squared on each cap. This means that the case will see a tensile load of 4,712 pounds inside the case connecting the two end caps. That's 21 kilonewtons for those of us uh, who prefer working in metric units. A quick area calculation shows us that this means that the tensile stress in the cross section of the case is 13.5 ksi, and 6061 is good to 35 ksi before yielding, so we have plenty of margin in the elastic region of this material. There are several ways to react this 4,700 pounds of force from the end caps into the material of the case itself. Most commercial rocket cases use threaded sections on the end for ease of installation and assembly, but this requires significantly more machining skills to make, and also it requires uh, that you have a machine large enough to accommodate your case. Because I'm used to working on larger motors and because I want you to be able to easily replicate this at home, we're going to instead select a different method of attaching the end caps. Small experimental rocket motors often use snap rings to hold the end caps in. However, this requires making your case thicker and therefore heavier so that you have sufficient material to put the groove in to hold the snap ring. My preferred method for holding the end caps of the case in is called radial bolts. In this method, all you have to do is drill some evenly spaced holes around the tube and duplicate those holes on whatever end caps you're using to hold the nozzle and the forward closure in. This technique doesn't even require a lathe. You could do this at home with a drill press and sufficiently good marking skills. Now, the force from the end cap will be distributed across several bolts into the case. How many and what size these bolts should be is an interesting question, and we want this case to be able to fit inside our rocket, so not only do the bolts have to be able to withstand the pressure, but they also have to not protrude too far to make it difficult to put inside of a rocket. Now, while smaller fasteners would be easier to fit inside the rocket, I don't want to spend forever messing with double zero fasteners uh, and finicking around with these, like, sub-tenth of an inch bolts out in the, the launch field where there's mud everywhere and dirt and sand, so we also want bolts to be easy enough uh, to use that I actually want to use the rocket motor case. Uh, so this kind of keeps us above the zero bolt size and below the 632 bolt size, giving us really like 256 and 440 as options, and 440 is clearly the superior choice here. Uh, it's easier to get your hands on and they're larger bolts. So we're going to go ahead and use 440 fasteners. Alright, so a 440 bolt has a shear strength of 940 pounds. That means that we need eight bolts in order to hold back the force on the closures on both ends of the motors. But I want a higher safety factor than eight bolts. So I went up to the next easily uh, counted number on my indexing head that I'm going to use to machine the case. And that number is 12 bolts. This isn't all we need to calculate though. In addition to the bolts shearing, they could possibly tear out of the material or collapse the holes they're drilled into. We'll analyze these cases with two additional calculations. We need to do a hole tear out calculation, as well as a hole bearing stress calculation. First, we'd look at a NASA technical memo like 106943. This is a very useful document for uh, deciding where you can place holes in a material to avoid creating stress concentrations. A good rule of thumb is to keep a hole at least one to one and a half diameters away from the edge of the material it's being drilled into. Now that we know how far away the hole is from the edge of the material, we can do a hole tear out calculation where we analyze the cross-section of the bolt hole and the material to the edge of the case, and we decide if there's enough strength there to withstand the force that the bolt will be applying on that material. I think this is a little hard to describe just by talking about it, so there's a graphic on screen somewhere. Alright, the next thing we need to analyze is the hole bearing strength. This is 
also kind of difficult to conceptualize, but you can imagine that since the hole has to be just a little bit bigger than the bolt that's going into it in order for everything to fit, the entire hole won't see the force of the bolt. It'll only be like one kind of area down uh, in the direction the load is being applied. So this means that if the load is high enough, you can actually start to deform the hole around the bolt, and this is bad. We want to avoid that, so we'll need to do the calculations to make sure that doesn't happen. Another kind of less engineering analogy you can use for this is if you've ever carried like heavy grocery shopping bags home, the disposable plastic kinds, while well, your arms may be perfectly happy carrying the weight of the shopping bags, the plastic kind of starts to bite into your fingers a little bit, and it's really uncomfortable. So bearing stress is technically the bearing load divided by the bearing surface, that is how much load is going through each bolt and the area that each bolt is applying that load to on the case. Like I was saying earlier, if your bolt was a perfect fit in the bolt hole, the area carrying that load would just be the circumference of the hole times the depth of the hole, but we know that's not the case. A typical rule of thumb engineers use to calculate the bearing stress is to assume that only 25% of the hole's area is going to be in contact with the bolt. And so this is a fairly good uh, estimate. Uh, you can refine that depending on exactly how tight your tolerances are, but for our cases, I'm not going to assume that I can do any better than average. The bolts we've chosen earlier also give us another benefit. I wanted the bolt heads to fit entirely within the case we are using, so that it could slide inside of a motor mount tube on a normal rocket. Since we'll be using flat head bolts with a chamfer on them, this means that we can tighten the bolts until they sit flush at the hole they're in. And this is awesome for bearing stress, because we can guarantee that the back side of the bolt with that chamfer on it will interface awesome with the hole it's in, because we can tighten it more until it's a perfect fit. This has the secondary advantage of guaranteeing that all the bolts see equal load during the motor startup transient. Uh, if you didn't have bolts uh, that were tightened up against their hole, they were just kind of floating around in their hole randomly, it's entirely possible that one side of the motor could um, see load from the pressure first, and this could deform those holes, and it would be a while before the bolts on the other side were able to take some of the load. This problem is alleviated by using these chamfered bolts. Probably this is the point in the video where I should talk about calculating bolt preload, but this is running long enough, so I'm just going to skip that entire paragraph I have typed out. Maybe I'll talk about how to calculate bolt preload at some later time. Alright, now that we've dealt with both ends of our motor case and the axial stress, now we need to worry about the hoop stress in the motor case. We're going to be making a couple of assumptions here to make the math easier to analyze, and these are good assumptions that are used by engineers all over the world in order to make their life easier. The first assumption that we're going to be making is that hoop stress is a pure strain condition in a thin wall pressure vessel. What does that mean? That means that the uh, material uh, is not going to see any stress distribution through the thickness of the case material, it'll all be equally loaded, and this also assumes that the uh, material is large, much larger in diameter than it is in thickness. Now, since we aren't actually calculating what the uh, thickness of the case needs to be in order to withstand these pressures, we're instead going to do a little algebra and rearrange it, and we're going to solve for the maximum pressure using the known thickness of the case that we have. The maximum pressure is just the tensile strength of the material times 2, uh, because you have area on both sides of the circle. Uh, times the thickness of the case, and then you need to divide all that by the diameter. Now, if you've heard me talking in PSI throughout the entirety of this video, I'm very sorry to all you metric users out there, I typically do most of my analysis in metric, but for some reason I have absolutely no head to analyze pressures in anything other than PSI. I just have no touchstone to relate to. I've gone ahead and done all these equations in a Python script, and I'm going to upload it on GitHub, link in the uh, description below, so you can run these equations for your own case design. Uh, I'm hoping that maybe I can get this converted into a plugin for open motors so you can run it from the software very easily. But that hasn't happened yet, and uh, we'll have to see if I run into free time. Okay, that ends the design portion of this video. Now it's time for a trip to the machine shop. Alright, change of plans. Instead of including the manufacturing in this video, I'm going to include the manufacturing in a separate video because the video is going to be almost 50 minutes long if I included all the manufacturing in this video. What I'm going to do instead is give you a list of materials that you need to purchase so that you can make one of these cases yourself. The bill of materials for one of these cases is surprisingly reasonable, they only cost about $45. And I think that's actually a great trade, it lets you be a lot safer than with a PVC pipe case, and you look way more professional too. Uh, the tools you'll need to make one of these cases is a drill press, a hacksaw, um, and then uh, either access to uh, uh, some basic machining tools or some 3D uh, or a 3D printer to print some of your own jigs and fixtures to get the angles right on things. Um, 
I think that's fairly accessible to most people. Uh, the materials you're going to need, links in the description down below, is going to be a 2.25-inch uh, outer diameter aluminum tube with a 2-inch inner diameter, and that comes in lengths of 12 inches. It's about $15 per 12 inches, uh, and you can make the case as long as you design your motor to be. And then you need the material to make the uh, end closures. Uh, those end closures are going to be a 2-inch outer diameter, 1.5-inch inner diameter tube. Uh, you'll also need a tap and die set and some drill bits and a countersink for your drill press. Okay, with all that taken care of, thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, the manufacturing video is the next one I'm going to do for the case and the closure rings. Uh, that is going to be coming much sooner than this one because I basically had to edit it to decide that this video was too long. Um, if you would like to support me making rocket motors, you can find links to my Patreon down below in the description. Another way you can support my work is just to leave a like and a comment. It inspires me to read how many people are trying their own rocketry projects. I've heard of amazing people doing amazing things from the people that have commented and sent me messages and emails as a result of me documenting how I build my rocket motors. So I hope that you are healthy and safe and having a wonderful day. Good luck and Godspeed. I'll see you on the next episode of Solid Rocket Motors. Goodbye.